Hey oh everybody, Haku here with my live reaction or read through for the second half of chapter 4 of Magical Girl Raising Project or Mao Shoujo Weeks a Keikaku Queens. Uh, so the first half of this was really good, it just focused on CQ Angel Hamuel and sort of building up and establishing what's going on with the siege on these ruins. And I liked the bits we got with Uluru and Mana. Uluru is like one of my absolute favorites right now. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited for the second half of this. We're going to be reading from chap er, from page 11 onward in chapter 4. Uh, I went ahead and looked at chapter 5 before this to see if I wanted to record both at once, if I wanted to record chapter 5 right after I finish this video, but I'm going to probably wait and record that a little bit later, uh, just so that my voice isn't gone for it. So yeah, I'm excited. Let's, uh, let's get into the second half of this chapter. Um... We're starting with Puck Puck here. The Ask for, er, yeah, just checking everything. Oh yeah, and I like the uh, involvement here of Yoshioka right at the end with the uh, Casper faction. I want to know more about the Casper faction and Ratsumu Kanahono Menokami. That is like, that is my favorite name. I love it. Um, so yeah, we're starting with Puck Puck. The Ask faction moved in fast. Certainly their leaders were efficient and was able to coordinate a far, er, together far better than any other faction. If Puck befriended them, they could help Puck Puck out tremendously, but Puck Puck also has to rely on her own faction and herself. She had to organize things for her friends, and ensure their safety. Everything Puck Puck did was for the sake of her friends and the people she wanted to befriend. As far as the magical girls around her have reported, the situation doesn't sound very good for Puck Puck right now. One thing I love about Puck's character, too, as kind of a villain, I guess. Like, she's got to be the villain, right? Um, one thing I like, though, is she wants to make everyone her friend. Basically, mind control, infinite Tsukuyomi, everyone. But at the same time, she views it as, just like her power is making friends with everything, or everyone, she views it as making friends with everyone. Um, so she has that, like, positive spin in her head with it. Um... Everyone is against the Puck faction. Everyone's attempting to oppose her. Not only that, but Puck Puck has lost people, too. All these things made Puck Puck sad. She was about to cry, but she didn't want her friends to see her in that kind of state. She retreated to her room. She needed something soft to pour everything towards. A large, uh, koala plushie. Puck Puck hugged the plushie and began to cry softly into it. Not loudly enough that anyone outside could hear, but she had to let the sadness out, or had to let the sad, let the sadness all out. Got tongue twisted. Uh, being turned against by the whole world and losing your friends at the same time, those were things that would make anyone sad. As a sage, Puck Puck must be an example to her friends and put on a cheerful and happy expression all around. She can't be judged by others as a crybaby, even though Puck Puck herself knew that she wasn't always perfect herself. Flaws and weaknesses can make a dent in friendship, and if Puck Puck couldn't make any more friends, then it's not worth it. I like getting into her psychology like this, like, because we could get, like, a sad backstory where people were horrible to Puck Puck, and that's why her power was just to make friends. And it's like this this, like, sort of positive thing gone very, very wrong. Even though the koala plushie is just that, a plushie, Puck Puck imagined that it was someone warmly embracing her, being hugged, being comforted, having someone tell her everything's going to be okay. And see, I think this is so telling, that she thinks that she can't show any flaws or weaknesses or people won't want to be her friends anymore, and that even though she has all these people that are forced to be her friends, she's not confiding in any of them, she's hiding away with a plushie. She calmed down, wiping away her own tears. She gently released the koala and laid down on her carpet. The carpet, the wallpaper, the ceiling the mountains of plush toys, the cute little vase decoration, a white lily sticking out of it. All of them were gifts from her friends, brought here from Puck Manor. It's as if she was still back home again, had a peaceful time. Puck Puck thanked everyone. She smiled happily at having friends who cared. She got up, making her face, er, making sure her face had no tear stains and looked prim and proper. Then she spoke to the magical girl whose room was just next door. Snow, you there? Yeah, what's up? Our friends at the entrance in the valley are in trouble. There was a fight earlier on. What do you think we should do? Well, are there any casualties? We should move the survivors back. Retreat to the entrance of the ruins inside the gate. 
It seems that Snow White had already thought of this plan beforehand, since there was no delay in her response. Could she have already formulated a way to use the environment while they were entering the ruins? Puck Puck wasn't good at battle plans, since she didn't enjoy fighting. That's why she brought in Snow White to help, so Puck Puck would trust what Snow had to offer. She had to make her an active member, after all. Still, there were some questions she had in mind. Um, sorry about the Snow. It's okay. What you apologizing for? Just a few questions, really, like why are we retreating from the valley entrance? Well, I gotta say, your first plan's fine. The valley entrance is huge, yeah, we can have magical girls with big magical abilities hit troops far more easily, but if they break through that defense through sheer numbers, we're going to be hard-pressed to retreat, and we won't be able to hold the fort in the strategic, more easier place to hold it in. Hmm, explain please. Aren't we just giving the valley entrance over to the enemy? The most important thing, right, er, thing about a first line of defense is where you put it. Not in the furthest place from where you want to defend, but in the easiest place to defend. It doesn't matter if they get the valley entrance, as long as they don't push through, the, through to the device, right? Right, and the ruined entrance is good because it's narrower. This forces the enemy to move ahead in a straight line. There's not much maneuvering space. And any large magical effects will most likely hit them more than us. We know the layout, right? We can set up elite magical girls to guard the narrow pass, and then we can ambush them. Ah, uh, an ambush, I see. Yep, that way they'll lose a lot more casualties pushing in. If they retreat, we can get even more of them. It's hard to maneuver in tight spaces, and for attackers, they're at a disadvantage. They have to send almost everyone in, not knowing what to expect. Defenders like us, we can set up magical girls suited for close quarters combat in the narrow passages, and leave magical girls with other roles later on. That's the key to a solid defense. And I love how, like, legitimately well thought out this is. It just shows that the author, the writer of this series, is just so smart when it comes to combat and stuff. Like, fights are incredibly well written in Magical Girl Raising Project, but this just shows that they just generally are smart when it comes to writing this combat stuff. Snow White thought further. Oh, the enemies are Shufflins, right? Shufflins have scouts, so it's more likely they'll send them in first. If we play our cards and destroy the scouts with huge magic, we're just letting them win, because they now have information. We should let them scout ahead, and then when the real army comes, that's the one we'll strike. But if we let them do that, what if they'll get deeper into the ruins? What if the fighting destroys the device? That won't happen. Why not? Because the other side doesn't want to destroy the device, they want to recover it from us. In fact, the deeper they fight us into the ruins, the less destructive magic they'll try to use, so we'll be at an advantage. Puck Puck realized Snow White's logic. It was a tactic that used the ruins themselves against the enemies, making sure the enemy has no advantage or room to run. Puck Puck looked up at Snow White. Snow White's eyes seemed to be full of pride, like she wanted to show off how useful she is to Puck Puck. Puck Puck agreed to that and stretched out her right hand happily, er, stretched out her right hand. Happily, Snow White crouched down, and Puck Puck stroked her head. See, that was brilliant. I love, that's, that's, uh, my favorite section we've read in a while. I liked all the other sections, but I love this delve into Puck Puck's mentality, and then having just the brilliant strategy from Snow White that is what you would do. Like, logically, that is the strategy that makes sense. I love it. Uh, so now we're actually, page 15, getting to see from Bluebell Candy. I don't think we've seen from her this entire arc yet. Um, so Bluebell Candy's point of view. Following Deluge this time, Bluebell found herself in some kind of wasteland. She drove the car there herself. Now she's in what seems to be a camp with tents everywhere. Glacianne wasn't with them. She didn't need to be thanks to her power. Far up ahead, there seems to be some kind of fighting going on between card soldiers. Deluge and Dark Cutie weren't with her at the moment. The sun is getting hotter and hotter. The card soldiers uh, fighting at the large gate charged inside the gate. Bluebell only watched from a distance. Bluebell didn't feel like she was very helpful, not at all. She was stressed out at not being supportive. She wanted to be supportive to Delu. She'd tried, er, she tried so hard to be that person to her, but as of late, Delu has been acting rashly, and now they're here. Bluebell will stick around. Bluebell can't just abandon Delu either. Bluebell knows that Deluge isn't a stupid person. She's well-adjusted and smart. Bluebell wanted that Deluge back. Lately, Deluge had stopped taking Bluebell's candies. 
At the very least, that means she's learned to calm herself down without them, which is a good thing. Now it seems Bluebell, or Bluebell's the one that's, or that's being stressed out. She wanted to eat the candies herself, calm herself down. She didn't just want to be useful to Delu, she wanted to be useful to everyone. Honestly, Bluebell didn't know or what she could do to help out around here. Troubling, isn't it? The fighting up ahead? She heard a voice. It came from beside her. A girl in a wheelchair. Bluebell had been a bit afraid of her before, but in her current state, anyone to talk to would be great. Ah, I didn't realize that you came by, Fla. Or Madam Fla. I, uh... <laughs> right. Don't stress yourself over titles. Fla is fine. Right. It's just, you're high up in a division, so I just assumed... It's fine, Bluebell. I see. Well, are things going okay where you are? It's a tightrope balancing act, and I'm walking the tightrope. I see. I didn't expect you to come all the way here. I thought she was going to make a joke about walking the tightrope, even though she's in a wheelchair, but... Okay. Of course I... Er... Of course I would. I'd have to supervise the upcoming battle myself. Coming here where everyone gathers is the only way I can do that. That makes sense, yeah. Why don't we take a look at the battle happening out there, shall we? Tell me, what do you see? Bluebell looked out, er, looked at the card soldiers. They were retreating from the gate as it began to close up once more. The cards with spears were guarding the other cards behind them. It's a retreat, right? asked Bluebell. Good. What about the other side? I can't see them. Correct, because they're still in the ruins. Hold on. Sorry, it looked at my little, like, capture preview screen or whatever, like the, uh, like the recording was messing up. But I went in and looked at it, and it looks fine, so I'll continue. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to stop really quick because of that. I didn't want to lose anything. Um, what about the other side? I can't see them. Correct, because they're still in the ruins. The Shufflin have taken down Puck's Magical Girls, as the Spades are excellent fighters. They have, but why are they retreating? Because victory isn't as simple as winning one battle. Retreat is not a defeat. The Puck faction showed their hand. Now we know what their opening defenses are. They'll have to regroup or they'll face losses next time we strike. But the Puck faction isn't foolish. Notice how none of them are chasing down the Shufflins. Yeah? Do you find that strange? How so? In a normal fight, routing usually means that you've won a battle. And the Puck faction has won the battle. But look, none of them are capitalizing on the Shufflins retreating. No magical girl wants to take a chance to chase down the Shufflins. I can't, er, I can't even tell who the enemy commanders are because they aren't giving any direct orders. I, I'm not following. They're in sync with orders given before the battle. Normally that doesn't happen in most cases, even in actual battles. You need a commander to keep them in check. These magical girls are individuals with their own personalities, but it seems they've all merged into one, working together towards a common goal. Doesn't that just mean they're loyal to their leader? Precisely. Far too loyal. No one's breaking rank at all. It's rather scary, but not even their personal motivations outrank their loyalty to their leader. I've no doubt this is due to the leader's magic. And see, this is such a smart way to out-strategize Puck's group, is that now Puck, because she's made this uh, strategy with Snow White, is going to give them orders beforehand, and they're going to follow the orders that Puck's given. So then if Flash slash Let's group, if their attacking army does something differently, there's not going to be any flexibility because they don't have a chain of command with commanders or anything. They're all just following whatever order Puck gave. So I like that. That's really, really smart. How can you tell? Their actions in battle. They have different ways to fight. Their personalities are all different, but after the battle they merge together. They're still themselves, but they're, to, er, but they're loyal to their leader first and foremost. I can tell because I can read people by their behaviors. This isn't a detailed read, just broad strokes, but that's usually er, but that's what I usually do. Flet turned her wheelchair toward Bluebell, but that's not why I'm here. I'm looking for Glassy Ann. Huh? Oh, she's resting in one of the tents. Oh, she's not here? Shame. Her powers are useful at times like these. She can get up close without hurting herself. Very well. Er, very well then. Apologies for bothering you, said Flet. She turned around in her wheelchair and moved away. Vlad only moved about two meters before she turned around again. Ah, that reminds me. How is Deluge? asked Vla. She's doing okay. With the shufflins around here, will she be fine? She... I think. She's calmed down a lot more now. With your candy? No. No, she hasn't been taking any candies lately. Vlad nodded. Then she turned around once more and rolled away. 
Bluebell simply watched Flez back as she left. So that's pretty strange, thought Bluebell. Bluebell looked around. Deluge and Dark Cutie still haven't returned yet. Bluebell, er, Bluebell sighed and began walking over to find an empty tent. She wanted to just eat her candies, relax, close her eyes, and rest for a long time. She can't handle the stress that's building up. She wanted to be supportive to everyone, but she's done nothing to help Deluge, Fled, Dark Cutie, or anyone in camp so far. If she's not useful toward anything, it felt like she would just disappear into nothingness. What's the point, then? As she walked around, a hand grabbed onto her. The hand's grip was hard. Bluebell couldn't react fast enough. Another hand gripped her neck as it pulled her toward a tent. Bluebell's body was thrown to the ground, and Bluebell wanted to scream, but a hand clasped her mouth shut. Her screams were muffled. Before she knew it, the hands began to feed her something, round orb-shaped objects. Forced into her mouth, upon, er, upon contact with her tongue, they melted instantly in her mouth. More and more of them were being force-fed to Bluebell. Bluebell realized what these were. They were her candy. She tried to spit them out, but the hand kept forcing them down her throat. The candies all melted in Bluebell's mouth. Bluebell remembered that she wasn't Bluebell. What? What? So there was like some 5D chess going on here? So wait. What on earth? Is Bluebell actually someone else? Or did the original Bluebell use the candies to make that Bluebell into like a spy? Oh gosh, I'm excited now. We're getting Princess Deluge's point of view. I wonder if that's going to elucidate what just happened. That was really good though. That was a good segment, just from the conversation with Flair, and this, this Bluebell remembered she wasn't Bluebell. This is really interesting. Princess, er, Princess Deluge. When Deluge saw staff members from the examination division, she didn't try to hide her face. Even though she knew she, er, she'd probably be arrested, Flair er, Fla assured them that Deluge won't cause any trouble. Deluge didn't delude herself into thinking she was quiet. People probably knew it was her who killed the Shufflins in the city. If Deluge was going to have problems here, she w sure she'll have to run again once more. Even though the, de the examination division will hold off on her, Deluge had agreed that it's best to stay away from most people at this time, so she usually spent most of her time inside her tent. Quake, Tempest, Inferno, Cherry, they were still fresh on her mind, even now. Yet, she remembered all their deaths vividly. How come they had to die? It was all their obligations as a magical girl. That was all she thought of as she killed those Shufflin. Now the Shufflin are partners. Deluge thought about the future. As long as she remembers the future and her plans, this would be okay for now. I heard from the, er, from the boss, said a voice. The voice came from behind her. On the tent wall, a dark magical girl in the shadows. Their tent looked rather age-old and a bit musty. The magical girl was holding her knees. She looked rather si er, silly sitting like that. The mage from the examination division has er, has the Puck faction's magical girl with her. Deluge remembered the incident well. Glassium was trying to scout inside Puck Puck's manor, looking for the whereabouts of Shadow Gale. In the middle of that, an examination division mage picked up an escapee, or rather it was one of Puck Puck's own magical girls. Since the magical girl had Snow White's back, Deluge decided to protect her for now. And what about it? Said, er, asked Deluge. I recognize her, from the amusement park, the one with the magic to make you believe her unconditionally. I killed her friend. I don't think that's just a friend to her. They seem to be too, er, far too close to be simple friends. Deluge raised her eyebrow. What are you trying to say? Dark Cutie smiled, almost as if she was excited. She doesn't know I'm here yet, but if she finds out I'm here, she might want to kill me. You seem happy about it. A little bit, yeah. I don't get it. You want to be killed? Dark Cutie shook her head. She looked at Deluge. That's not it. I'm just... I'm thinking of what a protagonist would do. Would she team up with the villain to stop a bigger villain? Or would she seek vengeance once she finds out the villain is here? What's more suitable for a main character? If it's the latter, a proper villain would prefer death. Of course, I perhaps... Er, of course, perhaps I should just showcase a difference in our strength. Then the hero will have to train harder and realize that vengeance isn't the only way. That would also make for a wonderful hero. Then she'll want a rematch. Now, mu er, now much stronger than I am. That would be a satisfying end, too. What should I do? I love that. I love that sort of... 
again, the writing in this is so good with Dark Cutie's character, where she's like, would she team up with me, the villain, to fight a bigger villain? Would she seek revenge against me since I'm the villain? Should I show her that I'm incredibly stronger so that she has to train and come back much stronger than me? I love that. Also, Dark Cutie was the one that killed Sarami? I thought, I thought Mi-chan was the one that killed her. Maybe I'm just remembering incorrectly. I guess maybe it was one of the Shadow Wolves saving Mi-chan? Maybe? Maybe I'm, maybe that's the full details? Like, I don't remember the exact details of her death off the top of my head right now. I, j I thought it was Mi-chan. Um, but no, I guess it was Dark Cutie saving Mi-chan after they both um, had that fight inside the place. Um, Dark Cutie started out talking to Deluge, but she started to mumble off and talk <laughs> while staring at the floor. Was she talking to Deluge? Was she talking to someone else? Was she talking to herself? Deluge ignored her. Glacian, Michan, Fla, all of them had told Deluge that this is what Dark Cutie tends to do sometimes. Most of them always had, er, had always let her be like this. But is that magical girl a villain too? Or not seeking revenge over the loss of fan- er, or not. Seeking revenge over the loss of family is often something that villains tend to do, but anti-heroes exist. Avengers are often heroes as well in some stories. Am I the villain in this case? No, I still am the villain to her. Er, just because she seeks vengeance doesn't mean she's a villain. It depends on how she acts. Avengers are complicated. They, er, they often are the ones that are willing to commit the most extremes, but sometimes they're still heroes. Again, Deluge simply tried to get some peaceful silence, despite hearing Dark, Dark Cutie talk over and over again. Looks like Dark Cutie may have gone stir-crazy. Deluge is an Avenger, right? Is she a villain or a hero? What is she capable of to seek vengeance on those who wronged her? Deluge widened her eyes, looking at Dark Cutie. But Dark Cutie wasn't even talking to Deluge. She was still in her own thoughts, looking at the floor while hugging her knees. I freaking love the insanity of Dark Cutie. This was a really, really great chapter. The er, second half of the chapter. The first half of the chapter focused all on one character, and it was really good, but this was incredible. We got a delve even more into flat or not flat into Puck Puck psychology. We got the cool Snow White strategy. We got the cool conversation between Bluebell and Flair with that twist that's now kind of a mystery. We'll have to um, see where that goes. And I love this stuff at the end. It was mostly comedic, but it was more of a dive into what Deluge is thinking of the situation, what Dark Cutie's thinking of the situation. And Dark Cutie's is comedic, but it's so good. Uh, so yeah, I loved it. Really fun video. Or, yeah, really fun video. I, li I like recording these a lot. Uh, so yeah, I will go and I'll get this video up as soon as I can, along with the one before this and the one after this. Like I said, we're getting three back-to-back -back MGRP read-throughs this week before I go back to just doing the normal one weekly. But yeah, that's it. Thank you for watching. Like if you did like the video, comment down there. Tell me what you thought of this week's chapter, my thoughts, and reaction, and all that. Um, Subscribe for more Magical Girl Raising Project, much more on the channel. Follow on Twitter if you want. If you want a link to the Discord server, asking, I'll give you one. And if you want to help support the channel on Patreon to help me keep making these videos and much, much more, it's patreon.com slash haiku of the tubes, or a link will be in the description. Either way, that's it. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.